USCHO.com. This is the USCHO Game of the Week podcast from U.S. College Hockey Online at USCHO.com. An in-depth look at this week's top college hockey matchup and a preview of the other big games. Welcome to the USCHO Game of the Week podcast for Friday, December 4th, 2020. I'm Ed Trefsker along with Jim Connolly. And Jim, the big news right now in college hockey has to be the NCHC pod in Omaha. And joining us now from inside the NCHC bubble in Omaha, Nebraska, Dave Starman. He will be uh, part of a large broadcast crew that is calling games from the bubble for Midco Sportsnet uh, and NCHC TV. Uh, Dave, uh, good morning. And what's it like in uh, Omaha this time of year? It, you know, the weather's great. Uh, we don't get to see a whole lot of the outside, but the weather's been good and this is a very unique experience. I mean, this, this has been pretty cool. And to, you know, we've been around the NCHC for a couple of years now and well, eight to be honest and nothing that they accomplish surprises me. It's it, Josh Fenton has done a remarkable job with a big staff who he has listened to and taken advice from, and they've just come up with a really good cumulative effort in terms of how they want to do this. And, there's a lot of safety protocols with hotels, with where you can go and you can't go, with where you can be in the rink and where you can't. I mean, it, it has been done extremely well. Well, let's talk just a little bit about it. Obviously, I think the question that comes to everybody's mind is how do you know the athletes and everybody that they are, is there is being kept safe? Testing is the big question. What is testing like for maybe from the student athlete, coaches, staff perspective, and then even from your perspective? You're, I know you don't get to interact, you know, face to face with anybody. You're more in the in the press box calling games. But what's it been like, just the testing so far? Well, the players are getting tested. I think they get tested like every two or three days. Or I mean, it's it's like one on top of the other. I feel like every time I call somebody, you know, just to get some info or chat up a coach or whatever they are sitting at the testing site or on their way to it. So it, it's been, it's been pretty stringent, you know, for us on the TV broadcast side, we're getting tested uh, every week. And, and then the protocols with the hotel, like the hotel that we're in, the, the way that they've got it set up is that you need your key to get in and out. And the hotel's basically on lockdown. And unless you are staying there or unless there's a delivery there, you're not getting in. So, I mean, that's been pretty safe, too. Everybody's wearing their masks. Everybody around Omaha is wearing their masks. And everywhere I go, people are masked up. So th th there's no doubt in my mind that safety is a huge priority. And I don't see any issues with the protocols that are in place right now. When talking with Josh Fenton earlier in the fall, I asked him about cities that they had considered. And he said that Omaha really stood out. And I, I, you know, I've been there before. I know Ed has been there before. And it's 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 vast and it's, you know, very... Uh, kind of well designed where you have a lot of hotels, you have a great medical center there. It was Omaha probably the best of the, the eight cities that they could have uh, put this in. Well, I mean, I think there are a lot of considerations that went in. I know the medical center was part of it and, you know, facility is part of it too. And there's, you know, Omaha does have a ton of locker rooms. They do have a building where there's two rinks inside the building, the main arena and the practice rink. So that, I mean, that helps. And I know a lot of rinks in the NCHC do have that, you know, then you talk about, hotels and walking distance to the rink. I think that was a huge factor. And, you know, having been around all eight cities at the NCHC on multiple times, this is probably the one that fits the bill when it comes to, can you walk out the door of your hotel and walk to the rink within five, to 10 minutes. And even on a really, really cold day or night, not feel like you're, you know, out there on the tundra. And I think that was, that was part of it too. So uh, for us, it's great. The walk to the hotel is less than five minutes. We're a front door to back entrance, nice and quick, and inside the entrance, right up to the to the press box where the elevator is right there. I mean, I you, you couldn't ask for anything more convenient. We're talking with Dave Starman. He's broadcasting along with Ben Holden uh, from the NCHC pod in Omaha. Dave, seeing the games you've broadcast and some of the other games, are there teams that have either impressed you by meeting expectations or maybe by exceeding expectations so far? Well, let's talk Miami for starters, because I've said that I think they're the team that's going to come out of this pod with the most improvement. It's, it's a team with 10 incoming freshmen and 18 returners. It's year two of the Chris Bergeron era. And the other day I said something about, you know, the buy-in from Miami in terms of defending harder and, and, and the things that, 
that Chris wants to see are starting to happen. And what I want to really make clear, and I'll talk about this on the broadcast on this weekend, is it's the buy-in from year one to year two of the Bergeron era. It's not the nobody paid attention to, to the end of the Blasey era, and now all of a sudden everybody's buying in. I mean, uh, I, it's a totally different story. It was last year, Coach Bergeron felt like they were just trying to get to know the team. Now they feel like one year in, they can ask for some more things and understand what should be accepted. So from year one to year two, I think there's a much different buy-in for the players that are in Miami's dressing room, and I think that they're going to benefit. I think they might have found a goalie who played really well against North Dakota the other day. Uh, Minnesota Duluth looks great. I mean, they are just – they are what they are. They are a 60-minute team that knows how to manage a game, that doesn't panic, that comes at you in waves, that defends hard. They, they've gotten really good goaltending too. Ryan Fanti, to me, is the story of the pod right now with two wins, and he has been terrific in both of them. I've really liked St. Cloud and their speed. I've liked Omaha and their their kind of straight line, outside drive mentality. Uh, North Dakota, I thought was, they were North Dakota. Deep, strong, heavy, nasty, a lot of snarl, a lot of sandpaper. Goaltending will be good. So, I mean, that's just kind of the, the impressions in Western Michigan. You, you really got to feel for them. I mean, there's a team that you, you lose Samuelson, Bafia, and Cam Lee. And Kacharik, who's a big time defenseman for them, is out. So that's four big veteran horses off their back line. So they're kind of rebuilding their back line. And they're a little thin up front, even though they have some skill. And you lose Brandon Bussey, who's your stud goalie, you know, 20 minutes into your season. So I, I think for them, whatever plan they came in with to go into the season probably starts to change a little bit with Bussey out indefinitely. Well, especially with a 10 to 2 drubbing at the hands of Omaha. Uh, was that game maybe a little uncharacteristic for both teams, or what was? What, I haven't gotten to see the highlights on that. Really, what ha- happened to, to see such a blowout? I'll tell you what. That was a four-two game at one point, and and it was a really good one too. I, I don't think Western had the same legs they had against uh, St. Cloud in the first game, and I do think the way they lost that first game was a little bit of a kick in the shorts. But they did show a lot of resilience, and Omaha, I think, did a much better job of moving pucks forward as opposed to spending the evening regrouping and reattacking, which they did a little bit too much of in game one. And, and I think it eventually hurt their offense. So you, you get that combination of, of both teams kind of doing what they're doing and, and question looks fine. And then the goal for the, I mean, they gave a couple of fluky ones, got them back. The five, two goal was kind of the air out of the sails. Cause Western probably figured at that point, they might not have enough firepower to get four legs to get back into it. But that is not a typical game watching Western. I really think that, you know, they're a team that is looking around the room right now as to, okay, we, we need to restructure this and how are we going to, how are we going to redesign the way we attack this as we get two goalies with really not a lot of game experience assimilated into the best conference in the country. And that's a tall order. You mentioned goaltenders. Uh, a lot of teams, it, it sounds like they're going to end up using a second goaltender that they might not otherwise in a two game weekend series, but goaltenders in particular, but the teams in general, how much is fatigue going to start playing in as this keeps going along? You know, I think that is the million dollar question. And I mean, let's be honest about it. Most of the players that are in this, in the pod here have played junior hockey where, you know, you get used to that kind of grind of four games in five nights or, you know, five games and eight nights, that kind of thing. You've got guys that have played this tournament that have played in the World Junior Tournament, you know, where, where that tournament is is hot and heavy early. And I do think fatigue is going to play a factor, much like it did with the NHL when they were in the bubble. I, it's, it's not so much the physical fatigue of of the games and the practices. It's going to be a little bit of the mental fatigue and the emotional fatigue of just kind of being in the same spot. And, you know, talking to NHL coaches and players that were in their bubbles and talking to the the coaches that were coming into this one, there was so much prep done to work rest ratios of games to practices. And where can we find time for guys to skip a practice to stay away from the rink and mentally refresh? And what can players do when they're not at the rink to be together and have fun and not just be sitting in their room doing nothing. I mean, I watched North Dakota have a great cornhole tournament yesterday. And I'll tell you what, Dane Jackson is as competitive at that as he was as a player. I mean, he would, he just, he would not lay down and lose. And it was just, it was cool to watch. So that's what's going on here. And that's how they're combating the medical, the mental, physical, emotional fatigue factor by keeping these guys busy, especially away from the rink. 
We're talking with Dave Starman, a well-known college hockey analyst. He's out in the pod out in Omaha for the NCHC. And want to touch on two games this weekend uh, that will be pretty big ones. Obviously, I think if when the schedule for the, the pod came out a few weeks back, if anybody circled one game, it was tonight's game between North Dakota and Denver, the only game being played out at Baxter Arena tonight. That's going to be one that uh, everybody is kind of looking forward to going into this one. Oh, I th- listen, I am really looking forward to it, and I, I never will ever say this, but I am actually ecstatic that I get to sit and watch it tonight. And Jake and, and Alex will have the call tonight, and Ben and I will get a chance to sit and watch the game and just be fans, and I'm really excited. Denver is fast. I mean, they are fast. And unlike last year where they were a nice team that played hard, this team is a team that plays really hard. That's a nice team. I mean, I know you guys are veteran hockey guys. You understand the difference. I mean, there's a little sandpaper in their lineup too. And uh, they come at you. They come at you hard. They, they kind of open the door for Duluth to, to take the game away from them on the power play. But for the most part, I really like this Denver team. You can see the difference between them this year and last year. And they are loaded for bear. And I think they're thrilled to death to get this game in while Bobby Brink is still in the lineup before he leaves with the World Junior Camp. And that's a good point, and that's something that will affect some of these teams with World Juniors starting. The, the second game, and you just mentioned it, how fatigue could be a factor in Denver. They're going to actually play back-to-back, and they'll play the second game uh, on uh, Saturday against St. Cloud State, a team that got a victory in their first game out of the gate. That should be a real test for Denver, knowing that you've got a rested St. Cloud team. They played well in their first game, and here they are maybe you know hungry to try to pull off an upset. So welcome to the NCHC, where you get North Dakota, the number one team in the country, one night, and then you get St. Cloud State the next night on back-to-back nights. And that's what this league's about. And and that will be the challenge for Denver. But I think for Denver, they're going to play North Dakota, and I think that game is going to be a you know it's going to be a little bit of a street brawl with a with with a lot of skill and some really nice plays. When they get to St. Cloud, uh, you know, my my feeling is that game could be over in an hour and twenty minutes. If you're the I joke with one of the referees, don't bring your whistle. You're not going to need it. Because those teams are going to go up and down the ice like it's a track meet. And, I mean, I can't wait for that one, too. That should be great. And, you know, let's be honest. All these teams are used to playing back-to-back nights. Maybe the three games in four night thing throws a little bit of a wrench in. And the, the lack of routine for, you know, a good practice or two between a couple of big games is, is part of this. But here's the reality of it. For the players, it's just about going out and playing right now because of the compressed schedule. And I think for them, that makes it a little bit more fun because there's less anticipation and more routine of just waking up and knowing it's game day. I think as the pod goes on, that's actually going to factor in and, and help them. Actually, one last question for you, Dave, before I let you go. Does the game day skate take on a different complexion where you're in a situation where you're playing so many games, you might not have a lot of time to get, say, your power play on the ice to work on something? Does are the game day skates maybe changing a little bit? Uh, I think it's a fair question, and it probably does. And you know, the one thing that the coaches have talked about, and I can remember from, you know, my days coaching in the minor leagues, I mean, there are times where you just have to know when to practice and when not to. So, I mean, you may, you might just take the team to the rink and have a stretch and maybe the guys jump on the ice for 10, 15 minutes and just, you know, do a flow drill or two and get out. Uh, maybe some guys just want to work on their face-off technique. So, I mean, they get on the ice for five minutes and get out. And it, it takes on more of an instructional theme than it does a group theme. And some guys will, you know, the guys will play heavy minutes. The coach may say to them, listen, don't even come to the rink unless you're fixing sticks. So uh, it's up to each coach and the leadership is where this really gets important. And I'll tell you a great story. I remember at the World Junior Tournament 2010, it was after like three games for USA and they were supposed to practice the day before they played Canada on that December 31st game. And Danny Christo and Derek Stepan went to Dean Blaze and said, and Chris Kreider, I think is part of that leadership group too, went to Dean Blaze and said, we are exhausted. We cannot practice today. We need a day off. And Dean said, okay, that's fine. But you, you know, you better not screw the pooch tomorrow night. <laughs> if I give you the day off. And, and they played pretty well against Canada, losing in a shootout that New Year's Eve game. But it, it, that's where the student lead, that's where the leadership inside the dressing room with the guy with the leadership group, knowing how to take the pulse of their team. That's where the trust factor of the coaches to the leaders is going to play a major role in how some of these teams succeed through the pod on that fatigue level. Well, it has been interesting, and we're only a few days into the the pod out in Omaha. Uh, Dave Starman, uh, best of luck. I know you're going to have to drink a lot of tea and keep that voice in good shape uh, because there's going to be a lot of talking to do between now and uh, late December when this whole thing wraps up. Lots of film and lots of Bigelow tea. You got it, brother. 
That's Dave Starman. You can catch him with Ben Holden on Midco Sportsnet's coverage of the NCHC pod as well as on nchc.tv. We've got more of the Game of the Week podcast coming up. This is the USCHO Game of the Week podcast from U.S. College Hockey Online. This is the Game of the Week podcast from uscho.com. I'm Ed Trefsker alongside Jim Connolly. And Jim, why don't we start out with the pod? Every game is a big game in that. And Dave Starman broke down the teams pretty well. But what stands out for you as a couple of key matchups over the next few days? Well, obviously, we, you know, we mentioned it. And it's, it's North Dakota uh, and Denver tonight. Then they're actually going to play again on Tuesday with games in between. I mean, that's what's it. This is such an NHL like schedule. Um, but, you know, we, when you think of the NHL, even when you maybe play a game inside your division, you know, if it's Boston or Montreal, whether it's, you know, Detroit, Chicago or something like that, you often find that they still try to do those as home and home series. It, it, you know, you don't usually see it in, interrupted by games in between. And here you are. Uh, there's just going to be such a plethora of games. You know, North Dakota, they're going to face Western Michigan before they face Denver again. Denver is going to face St. Cloud State before they face North Dakota again. So you're you're preparing as a coach. You you know, you try to prepare all week usually for the same opponent back-to-back nights. And You know, that's what I've always thought, say, makes the ECAC sometimes hockey East so interesting is that you don't have that situation always. But, you know, here you are in the NCAC, you're, you're, so accustomed to playing the same opponent back-to-back nights. Now you're changing every single day. You've almost got to worry more about just executing what your team does well than really being able to be concerned too much about the other team. Yes, you, you might be able to break down their power play. You might be able to look at some certain players, but you can't sit there and design you know certain game plans for every single team. It just it feels unrealistic because things change just so quickly. When we turn to the Big Ten, uh, they're in the middle of two game series right now. It's it's hard to even plan a game of the week podcast because there are games going on just about every day. But uh, Minnesota has one more tilt against Michigan State, a three one win last night. Minnesota at five and zero, and when Minnesota goes four and zero to start a season, good things happen. They've been in the Frozen Four uh, those last four times and won a national championship in one of those as well. Um, meanwhile, Michigan. Uh, Penn State got its first win against Michigan uh, at uh, Pagula Ice Arena in Hockey Valley, a 9-5 blowout. But uh, things in the Big Ten are starting to kind of settle in. Maybe Michigan's not off to the fast pace we thought they might be. And wow, watch out for those Golden Gophers. The Gophers we knew coming into the season, really, they were so stacked. They returned so much of their team from last year, a lot of talent. They just needed to take a step forward, get out of the gate strong, I think was something that I remember saying either on this podcast or maybe on BTN earlier this year. You know, that's always kind of in the last few years been the, their their uh, Achilles heel is that they fall behind and then they're kind of chasing their schedule, you know. To be five and zero oh at this point in playing really good hockey. I mean, their, their goaltender had a very long shutout streak, uh, broken last night. It was over 140 minutes, I believe. And you know, th- those numbers are, are are solid. And to know that they're putting the puck in that, they're getting they're getting exactly what they want from every game to this point. They'll play uh, Michigan State again um, tonight, and that should be another good tilt and a possibility, you know, barring the upset of going, you know, starting the season six and oh, and that's, that's a very strong start considering that you had, as you mentioned, a Michigan team that got off really quick, but they've kind of come back to earth. You had uh, Notre Dame struggle out of the gates and, you know, they, their struggles still continue. You had Penn state, you know, not scoring goals. Boom. They put up nine on Thursday night uh, against Michigan. So, Things are starting to change a little bit from maybe some of the assumptions we were able to make early in the, the, the season. Well, early, you know, a few weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago is what I really should say. Uh, the other team that we can't though sleep on is Ohio State, uh, playing some pretty good hockey right now. And, you know, that's a team that we, I think we all knew they, we, they got a little bit hidden in a lot of the conversations just because of the fact that they, uh, started. Uh, you know, later than everybody, but they've played some good hockey in their last couple of games. I'd look for them to be a team that starts to turn it around as well. So a lot of good hockey being played in the big 10, you know, you look at how many teams are ranked right now in that conference and uh, there's going to be a lot of upsets, but you know, we're looking at a Minnesota team here that they're just going to try to keep their foot on the gas pedal. 
You mentioned Ohio State. They have the second half of a two-game series at home against Wisconsin. The Badgers are going to be a good team, but right now they're a bit depleted. They are, you know, and, and that's a, a very tough situation for them um, to, to have some injuries, have, you know, guys that have gone to world junior camps. They're going to have, I believe, more players head off soon. That's really a tough situation to be in. And I think that they had some high hopes coming into the season. A lot of people believe that this was maybe the year that Tony Granado would be able to turn things around and finally get them back to their winning ways. And it hasn't you know, gone that way right out of the start. That said, They've got enough talent there that they're going to win games. Um, and, you know, that's really what it comes down to is finding ways to win those games. Um, you know, they've, like you said, they've, they've taken their knocks at times this season, but they, they have too much talent there. It, it, as they kind of recover from some injuries, you know, as we get into the second half, they get guys back uh, after World Junior Camp. They, you know, they could be in a better situation. Arizona State. Moved to 500 last night with a 6-3 win over Notre Dame. They have the fighting Irish again. We said when the Sun Devils got off to a slow start, they were going to be okay. They were going to be good. It seems like they've learned from those early ones, and they're kind of back to playing Sun Devil hockey. Yeah, I, I agree with you there. And You know, they they were 0-3-1 out of the gate, um, and then they, you know— put up eight against Wisconsin. Then they, you know, had to play a kind of different game the second night, a three, one game. And then I had a chance to watch that game last night uh, against Notre Dame. I thought they looked excellent. Um, I thought they they had a lot of speed. They were very opportunistic. Um, you know, Notre Dame found ways to put pucks on the net and that, you know, some dangerous shots. And I think there was a flurry in the second period where Notre Dame was down to, they scored, they hit a post. They uh, had one that the goalie made a nice save on. I mean, so it, it was a very, it was an excellent hockey game. A six-three final does not really describe how tight of a game that was at times. Um, but the fact of the matter was, Arizona State got out early and made Notre Dame chase the game. Notre Dame has never, under Jeff Jackson, been a team that's been fantastic at coming back from multiple goal deficits. So, if no, if Arizona State can start on Friday the way that they did on Thursday. Uh, very dangerous team, very uh, good offense. If they keep, get that clicking, real dangerous team this Arizona State club can be. A couple of non-conference games between Hockey East teams. Uh, the one I'd really call out getting their season underway on Saturday night at Schneider Arena, Providence hosting BC. It is, and that that should be the you know the contest that everybody is talking about. Everybody wants to see how good this Providence team is. Um, there's, I, I, I think I maybe picked them fifth in my uh, preseason rankings. People had them as high as second. Um, it, it, people understand that th- there's a lot of question marks, but when you have one of the most talented forwards in the country in Tice Thompson, you can get some goals out of that, and that's going to be a big part. Goaltending will be a question. I think that that is kind of the biggest question mark for this team. Um, and replacing some goals. They lost a lot of goals um, in terms of guys that either left early or graduated. So I think that this is an intriguing matchup because we know that BC is pretty solid. We saw that the way they came out of the gate last weekend against UMass and played two really solid games and uh, heard from Jerry York a little bit after that. And he's proud of the way his team's playing. He likes the way his team's playing. They're not only just getting contributions from some of their upperclassmen, their sophomores and their freshmen. I wrote about it in my column this week. They're probably some of the best players right now on this team. And uh, that's without Alex Newhook, who's been at the Canadian World Junior Camp, uh, you know, for a couple of weeks now. And will be there for another uh, month plus. So I love this BC team. They're going to get their biggest test of the season right now, though, this weekend. When we look to Atlantic hockey, I I think it's a league that is completely up and down, uh, completely uh, un predictable because of the pods with all the Western teams and all the Eastern teams playing each other so much, but air force is going to play everybody twice. Robert Morris goes out there. The interesting story at air force, we talked about Wisconsin being depleted between protocols and injuries. Air force uh, called up a junior who they cut from the team as a freshman, Billy Duma. And uh, he's been their video manager and doing a great job at that. They've had to activate him, and he's uh, back in the lineup, played the games against American International. Just uh, shows you how unpredictable and odd this season is. But uh, there's a full slate of games as they finally get a a good season start there in Atlantic. But, Jim, before we move on uh, to the end of the program, a couple of things we wanted to bring up. One thing that I did want to mention is some, some clarification. First of all, some advice. 
When you see something on social media or if you see show notes or a summary of something, make sure you read the whole article or listen to the whole podcast or you may get the wrong idea. I just want to uh, uh, repeat that what Jim and I were talking about in our Sunday night podcast or our uh, weekend review podcast about whether teams should be playing or not is not whether there should be a season or not. But if you're going to have a season, should you be playing now between uh, the end of November and the end of January when there are no students on campus? And our our consensus on that was rather than waiting and seeing what might happen and seeing things get worse, get those games in when you can get them in. Uh, whether teams should be playing or not is uh, a matter for somebody with a with a different pedigree of information and here at USCHO, if games are going to be played, we're going to cover them. Yeah, and that's right. I mean, we, you know, we talked to uh, a number of people and I, you know, I, I talked, uh, you know, not even through the podcast, but just for my column this week to talk East commissioner, Steve Medcalf and, you know, his point was that they're hoping that they can turn a corner with less students on campus. Hopefully that can, um, you know, really s- slow the spread of COVID um, these teams, you know, talking to some of these coaches about what life is like, and it's, you know, it's it's life in the dorms. You know, they 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 are in their dorm room, they go to practice. Uh, they're they're found ways to get meals, usually in small groups. Um, then they go back to their dorms, and they pretty much stay there the whole day. So, they, I mean, the players are doing great jobs across the the entire college hockey world of trying to make uh, this a season that works and getting, you know, the the making the protocols. Uh, be something that's being followed. And, and we, so we're seeing, for the most part, a lot of safety. Are there cases? There's going to be cases. And then do games have to be canceled because of contract tra- contact tracing? They, they certainly do. You don't want to uh, potentially put, uh, you know, knowing that you might have one case, you don't want to put 16 other players out on the ice against an opponent uh, when those people could be positive and they 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 just, those you know, results haven't showed up yet. We haven't seen extensive um, spreading though, when one team gets a case, it's not like they usually then get ten or twelve. This is, you know, for the most part, the majority of the times, it's been one or two cases within a program. Shut things down, quarantine, do what you have to do, follow the protocols, and then try to get back on the ice. So, you know, talking to Steve Metcalf, he feels like they're starting to get teams that can be back on the ice. Now they had another positive at Boston University on Thursday. They, they'll follow the protocol, but he his uh, when I talked to him this week, he says by December 18th, he believed all 11 teams would be ready to go. You're gonna have to take that back to 10 now because BU men uh, sound like they won't be ready to go. But if you can have all 10 teams ready to go on December 18th, get some games played now because this is the actual time that you have the best chance to get games with without the risk of other students on campus infecting uh, players. So. That is was a, a big note, um, and, and just you know, it's just the amount of effort that I see these leagues putting in. We just talked to Dave Starman about the, you know how far the NCHC has gone, but these leagues are putting in so much work to make sure that there can be a season. Um, we're going to cover it because that's our job. Uh, I don't want to get into philosophical conversations of yes or no. I think that what is being done is being done well and being done responsibly. The other thing that's being done very well on short staffs and difficult situations is streaming video coverage of all the different leagues. And I've been able to catch coverage uh, uh, from uh, Hockey East and and what they're doing streaming through CBS, Flow Hockey, that Atlantic Hockey and WCHA do. They uh, are doing a fine job with that. Uh, Big Ten Network and BTN Plus, oh boy, my hats are off to them. I've seen so much more Big Ten hockey this year, partly because they're playing on nights when I'm available, but the the coverage and uh, the ability to get the games on through the BTN Plus app have been terrific. And of course, nchc.tv, which really started to push the envelope for college hockey. Uh, Even if you don't subscribe, and I, I would suggest if you're a fan of a team and you're not going to games, take what you would have spent on tickets or season tickets and put it into the streaming service for that league. Even if you don't subscribe to NCHC TV, you can see highlights and compressed games on there. So there's a lot of college hockey video. I know it's difficult for broadcasters. Sometimes they have to be remote. I had to do that last Sunday, calling a game remotely. I know our buddies uh, Wally Shaver and Frank Mazzacco had to do that. They couldn't go to East Lansing, and they had a video set up in order to do the games on radio for the Twin Cities. 
Uh, everybody's doing the best they can. And I, I really salute everybody for getting it together and making these broadcasts happen. Yeah. I, you know, real shout out to the leagues, obviously for, for putting together these deals and uh, you know, the NCAT using Midco um, big 10, the, you know, big 10 network. You've also, because of Notre Dame, you've had NBC, both the national network where the game tonight uh, against Arizona state will be on, on Friday. Um, and then the, the regional using the NBC regional, I, I, you know, NBC sports, Boston picked up the NBC sports, Chicago uh, broadcast last night. So I was able to watch that game uh, in ESPN, ESPN, U, Colby Cohen and John Butcher Gross, They were out at uh, uh, Penn state earlier this week. So the, the ability, and I shouldn't leave out Nesson. Nesson is doing a great job out in the, the hockey East market, the ability to get these, you know, in a year that you're not going to probably have a fan ever get to a game. Uh, they're finding ways to bring the games to the fans. And I think that is uh, so great. It's it's the way that it, you have to kind of operate in this strange world. But I think the leagues, the networks, the broadcast teams, the crews, the producers, all of that stuff. And don't forget, all of these are being produced on Skeleton Crews. These are not uh, your, you know, your typical ESPN or ABC or NBC massive, you know, trucks with, you know, 100 people on on staff on site. This is all Skeleton and Cruz, and they're doing a great job. And I should mention ESPN Plus also is uh, that's who is the streaming provider for ECAC hockey, and Clarkson and Colgate have already been streaming through them. Well, that's going to wrap it up. Uh, we've had a lot to cover in an odd season and an odd schedule, but we'll keep bringing you these Game of the Week podcasts as well as USCHO Spotlight in the middle of the week and after the weekend weekend review. For Jim Connolly, I'm Ed Trefsker, and we'll catch you next time. This has been the USCHO Game of the Week podcast, a production of U.S. College Hockey Online. Visit usco.com slash podcasts to listen or subscribe.